We are Calvary Bible Church, and due to the coronavirus, this is our online-only worship service for Palm Sunday, April 5th, 2020. If you're part of our church family here at Calvary, we miss you and wish we could gather, but thank you for taking time to watch this online and to worship with us today. If you've never been to Calvary and you've just found us because you're looking for a place to worship the Lord and hear His Word, you're welcome to. And uh, as you watch this at home, we invite you to worship with us. We have created a free app for your device, and if you don't already have it, you can download it at calvaryapp.com. 
And in fact, if you would take out your device at this time and go ahead into the app and tap on the Sunday tab and then tap on the front of the virtual response card and take a minute to fill out the front of the virtual response card so that we can know who watched this service and have the opportunity to meet any needs that you have. Our scripture reading for this message is from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 34. And so let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to that passage of scripture. If you want to use the app, you can again just tap on the Sunday tab if you're not already there, and then just tap on the uh, today's message notes section, and the scripture reading that I will read will be there in my notes uh, for you to follow along as I read. But one way or the other, please follow along as I read from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 34. Luke chapter 23 verses 26 through 34. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the, tree, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is God's word. When someone is executed in this country, we have a tradition of sorts, and that tradition is asking the person who is being put to death if he or she has any last words. In 1995, a man by the name of Thomas Grasso was executed by the state of Oklahoma. And his last words were, I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti. I want the press to know this. That was his statement. Those were his last words. His last words were a complaint about his final meal. Now, I'll tell you more about Mr. Grasso in a minute, because he illustrates something that is true about many people who are executed as criminals. And that truth is this. People who are executed usually only care about themselves. And I'm going to leave Mr. Grasso's quote and his face on the screen for a moment because I want to talk about him some more. What he said at the end of his life illustrates something that is profoundly true about many people who are executed. And that is that people who are executed usually are only thinking about themselves. They usually only care about themselves. There are some exceptions. Some people who are executed do express remorse they do ask for forgiveness from the families of those whom they may have killed or from their own families, or they may express love for their families, or they may express concern for other inmates on death row that they feel may be innocent. All of these things happen. But in many ways, when someone is being executed, when someone is being led away to give their life for crimes that they have committed, they are very often preoccupied with themselves. 
And this self-preoccupation didn't begin after they were convicted and put on death row. In fact, really in many ways, the crimes they committed show no care for others. Thomas Grasso here was sentenced to death for killing two people. One of the people he killed was an elderly woman. He killed her on Christmas Eve after breaking into her house, and he strangled her with the Christmas lights off of her Christmas tree and robbed her. He also killed an elderly man so that he could steal that man's social security check. The fact that he robbed and killed these two people shows that he had no care for them as people. He was willing to take their lives for himself because he showed no care for others. He cared only about himself. And not only do the crimes of those who are executed show their selfishness, but their last words often show that they care only for themselves. Thomas Grasso admitted to both of these murders. In fact, he told the police about one of them. And he pleaded guilty in court. But in his final words, he showed no remorse. He made no statement of regret. He expressed no love for anyone else on earth, no family or friends. Instead, he complained about getting spaghetti instead of SpaghettiOs. But although he didn't get the SpaghettiOs he had ordered, he did have quite a last meal. In addition to the spaghetti that he got by mistake, Mr. Grasso got four dozen steamed mussels and clams, a Burger King double cheeseburger, a half dozen barbecued spare ribs, and two strawberry milkshakes. And yet when he came to the end of his life, was he grateful for the last meal, the feast that he got? No, all he could do was feel sorry for himself and complain that he hadn't gotten the SpaghettiOs that he ordered. Instead, someone made a mistake and gave him spaghetti. So nobody should feel sorry for Thomas Grasso or his lack of SpaghettiOs. Instead, we should see the truth, that his complaint shows himself to be a man who cared only about himself. And this is true, usually, of people who are executed. People who are executed usually only care about themselves. And to some degree, we can understand why. If you're about to have your life taken from you by the state, you might wonder if there's going to be any pain and suffering involved. And you might wonder what is waiting for you on the other side of death. And so a certain amount of selfish preoccupation is somewhat to be expected. In this passage of Scripture, though, we see Jesus on his way to his execution. And the things that Jesus says in the verses I read to you a few moments ago and that we're going to study together in this message show just the opposite of the kind of self-preoccupation that someone like Thomas Grasso showed. People who are executed usually only care about themselves, but not Jesus. As Jesus was executed, he cared only for others. Despite the pain that he was in, and despite what awaited him on the place, the hill where he was crucified, what we see in this passage of Scripture is that Christ had an incredible an almost total sense of thinking and caring for others as he went to the cross. The passage opens here in our text in Luke chapter 23. In verse 26, with Jesus being led out of the court of Pontius Pilate. Verse 26 says, As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. And that last phrase that Simon was on his way in from the country is there to tell us that Simon was not a party to the trial of Jesus. He was not one of those who sought Jesus' execution. In fact, he had nothing to do with any of this. He was on his way into the city of Jerusalem as Jesus was being led out because criminals were executed outside the city of Jerusalem. 
And so here's a man who's coming in on the same road that they are taking Jesus out on. And Jesus, having been up all night and having been in agony over the, cro- over the coming cross, having had no sleep and having been whipped to the point of near death, is unable to carry the cross beam as was required by Roman law. He fell under the weight of that cross beam because of his weakened and sleep-deprived state. And so this man, Simon, from Cyrene was taken by the Romans. They had the right to compel anyone in their empire to do certain basic tasks for them. And so the Roman soldiers grabbed this man on his way in and forced him to carry the cross of Christ. And verse 26 goes on to say, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, the cross bar that Jesus would be, his hands would be nailed to. They put him on his shoulders. And it says at the end of verse 26, and made him carry it behind Jesus. And so here we see Jesus on his way from the court of Pontius Pilate to the place where he will be crucified. But verse 27 tells us that his case had attracted quite a lot of attention. And verse 27 says, a large number of people followed him. Word apparently had spread that Christ was being put on trial. And people came to see what the outcome of that would be. And perhaps people in the street who were busy going about their, their, biz, their, their business during this holy week saw that or heard the commotion and wanted to see what was happening. And so verse 27 says, a large number of people followed him. But then it says this, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And this verse indicates that when Jewish people were executed in Jerusalem by the Romans, there were some very compassionate women, some Jewish women, who sort of took on the role of showing compassion for these men. And they would do that in two ways. First, they would give them a spiked drink of wine, was spiked with opiates, to try to dull the pain that these men who were being crucified had already, were already experiencing and would experience even greater when they got to the place where they were crucified. And so they brought this along to try to give, show some compassion to these men who were about to die. But then they would also follow along and mourn and wail for this man who was being crucified. Again, it was an act of mercy and an act of compassion. And it was something that certain women who lived in Jerusalem would do to care for the Jewish men of their country who were being executed by the Romans. But Jesus, despite the injustice of what was happening to him, despite being up all night, and despite being whipped to within an inch of his life, turns and addresses these women. They were mourning for him. And yet Jesus speaks to them. In verse 28, it says, Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem. And the point of saying this is that we are to understand these are not the women who followed Jesus around during his ministry. These women lived in Jerusalem. This was sort of their their ministry. It was sort of their informal uh, job, their volunteer uh, position to do this. And so Jesus addresses them because they lived in this city. And Jesus knew what the outcome would be. And so he says to them in verse 28, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Now, throughout the gospel according to Luke, and even as Jesus had just entered the city a few days before during his triumphal entry, which happened on the day that this message is going forth on Palm Sunday, on that day Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem. And yet the Bible tells us, Luke tells us, that he wept over the city and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, how often I would have loved to gather you under my wings like, like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And so he foretold the coming judgment of God upon the Jerus- on Jerusalem. And now as these women are weeping for him, he turns to them and with a heart of great compassion to them, tells them not to weep for him, but rather to weep for themselves. And the reason Jesus said this is, Because he cared about those who would experience God's wrath. What Jesus is going to say in verses 26 through 31. 
explains why he said, don't weep for me, weep for yourself, because the wrath of God is coming upon you. And verse 26 goes on, or verse 28 goes on and says this, Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. Now, Jesus does not overtly say, weep because God's judgment is going to come on you and on your city. Instead, he says it in a more graphic way and in a way that women especially would identify with. Everyone, of course, who has a family, who is married, desires to have children and to care for those children. But in Israel especially, it was important for women not to have children because they love children. It was in addition to that, in their society, it was expected that women would have children. It was considered a blessing of God. And so therefore, a woman who could not have children was considered under the curse of God. People in their society looked funny at women like that. They expressed a level of concern about them. And so it was, in a sense, a great honor to have children, not only because of the love that they had for their children naturally, but because of the societal expectations that every woman should have children and want children and raise children. Jesus in this verse, though, says in verse 29, the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. This is a reverse of expectations. Instead of saying the woman who has many children is blessed, Jesus is saying, weep for yourself because there's going to come a day when you're going to say the women who are better off are the ones who don't have to worry about their children, who don't have to see them fall under the mighty judgment of God. And so Jesus, in a very graphic way, in a, women that, in a way that the, these women especially would identify with, foretells the coming judgment of God on his people for rejecting Messiah, for rejecting Jesus Christ, and for demanding him to be crucified. Jesus foretells the coming judgment of God. And he goes on in verse 30 to say this, it's going to be so bad, he says, then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. In other words, they are saying immediate death is better than falling under the wrath of God, than having the wrath of God fall on us in a prolonged way. Jesus is saying the people who are considered blessed are those who don't have to worry about their children falling under the wrath of God, and those who die quickly because they won't have to uh, endure all of the torment that goes with being under the wrath of a holy God. And so Jesus, despite the fact that he is on his way to die and the fact that he is in great pain already, shows great care for those who will fall under and experience the wrath of God. And then in verse 31, Jesus sums it up with a very strange proverb. He says in verse 31 to these women, For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry. And we don't know if Jesus is, I think he probably is, using a proverb that was familiar to the people in their day. Because it's kind of an incomplete proverb. It doesn't really say that much. It doesn't, it doesn't give us everything we need to understand it. But it's not too hard to understand. If you think about setting fire to something, and fire is often a symbol or an actuality of God's judgment in the Bible. It's, of course, much easier to set fire to something that is dry. That's what you look for when you want tinder to start a fire with. And if the judgment of God is like fire falling, and Jesus then is like the tree, he is, he is life-giving and he is alive spiritually. And so what he's saying here is, the judgment of God is falling on me. Yes, that's true, but I'm an innocent man. The tree, as it were, Christ himself is green. He is alive. And yet God's wrath is going to fall on him. And then the last part of the proverb in verse 31 says, what will happen when it is dry? He's making a comparison and saying, if my experience of the judgment of God for sinners is bad, imagine how intense 
the burning will be, the judgment of God will be upon you, Jerusalem, which has no spiritual life, which has rejected the Messiah, which is very guilty before God. Imagine how much you are going to burn when the fire of God, the judgment of God falls upon you. And so as Christ was going to his execution, he shows tremendous selfless love and compassion for these women who are mourning him. He cared about those who were going to experience God's wrath. But as we go on and continue to follow Christ on his way to the crucifixion, we're going to see his compassion expressed even more. Verse 32 tells us that Christ was not alone in his crucifixion. And it's going to introduce two characters into the story that we'll come to in another message coming up. But verse 32 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And so these three men are on their way to the cross, carrying the beam on which they will be crucified. And verse 33 says, When they came to the place called the skull, and so we are to understand that outside the city of Jerusalem, there was a hill. And the way that hill protruded out of the ground made it look like a human skull. And this is where the crucifixion took place. And so verse 32 says, Two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, verse 33, they crucified him there. And Luke spares us the gory details of the nails being placed into the hands and feet of Christ. He just tells us in summary form that Christ and these other two men were crucified. It says in verse 33, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And so as they enter this place, this, and they ascend this hill called Golgotha, the skull, and the beams are already in the ground where the men will be crucified. The hands and feet of Christ were nailed to that cross, and the other men were secured to the other crosses on either side of him. They were put up on that cross, about seven feet in the air, where they would slowly suffocate to death over many hours. The Romans crucified people this way. They killed criminals this way, not only to torture them as they died, but to serve as an example to others who might be thinking about committing similar crimes to these men. We're going to find out later that over their heads, The charge for which they were convicted was placed so everyone would know what they had done and what Rome thinks about what they had done. And it was done to communicate to all the people in Jerusalem what the Roman Empire would do to anyone who dared to commit these crimes. So the crucifixion of Christ and these men was very public, intentionally so, and it took a long time intentionally so. And yet as Christ is suffering there in agony on the cross, once again we see that his care is not for himself, but rather he expresses care for others. He's already talked to these women and expressed care for them because they and the others of Jerusalem, the people of God, are going to experience the wrath of God. But now in verse 34, the first part of the verse, we see these words, Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Many men who are executed for their crimes in our world protest their innocence right up to the very moment that they are executed. But Christ was already exonerated. Three times Pontius Pilate told the Jewish people that he was not guilty of the crimes that they had charged him with. And yet, Pilate gave in to their pressure and crucified him anyway. Yet Christ himself knows that he is an innocent man, 
the only innocent man who has ever lived, truly. And that his relationship with God the Father remains unbroken. He says, Father, forgive them. And by calling God his Father, we see that Christ maintains his innocence. He maintains the special connection to God the Father that he alone had. And that he exhibited throughout his life. And in his final prayers to God, this being one of them and another comes later in the passage. Jesus is not calling for himself to be rescued from the cross. He's not protesting his innocence and saying, God, save me from this hour. Declare my innocence and release me from this cross where I'm being crucified. No, Christ's focus is not on himself. His care was not for relief from what he was suffering. Instead, Jesus cared enough to ask God to forgive those who crucified him. This is an amazing act of mercy on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ or by the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of others. And in asking God to forgive those who were party to his death, those who betrayed him, those who unjustly tried him, those who whipped him and mocked him and scorned him, and those who put him on the cross. In asking for God to forgive them, Jesus was not absolving these men of their sins at all. Because the Bible says that God only forgives the repentant. No, but what Jesus was asking was that God would give the grace of repentance to these men. That God would give in his mercy a heart to see their sin and turn from it and come to him for forgiveness. This is an incredible act of the mercy of God. And as Jesus was executed, he did not care about himself. His care was only for others. He cared about those who were going to experience the wrath of God. And he cared enough to ask God to forgive those who crucified him. But the care and compassion that Christ shows in this passage was not only for those who lived at the time that he lived. Because the crucifixion of Christ was designed to show the mercy of God to sinners in every age of life. And that goes for you and me, sinners who live today. Jesus cared enough to ask for God's forgiveness for these people, and he cared enough to show compassion and urge repentance on those who are going to experience God's wrath. But here's another truth. Jesus still cares. He cares for us. And because he cares for us, Jesus died to save us. This is why Jesus did not ask for the deliverance of God from the cross. Jesus knew that the cross was the only way to save us. And because of his love, because of God's love for us, he cared enough to die for us. And Jesus told the disciples this just a few minutes, a few hours before his crucifixion, before his betrayal, before the events that led us to the cross happened, Jesus said these words. In John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And then he goes on to say what that means, as I have loved you. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Christ went to the cross and died for the disciples, died for the saints in the Old Testament, died for those who would come to faith in him, and died for us who believe in him. Because he loves us. And his death, by his own words, was the greatest expression of love that he could ever have given to us. And Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, tell us this same truth. They tell us that this was God's expression of love for us. We understand that Christ is God. He is the second person of God. And yet all three persons of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, loved us 
and ordained that Christ would die for us. And so Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10 says, But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? And I talked about this in the preceding messages, how Christ was receiving the wrath of God for us on the cross. And because He did so, this passage says, how much more will we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? This is why Jesus died on the cross. This is why He did not demand rescue from crucifixion. Because He loved us, and the only way for Him to redeem us in His love was to take the wrath of God for us so we could avoid the wrath of God in the future. And so Jesus was executed, and as he was executed, unlike most other people who are executed, Jesus cared for others, not for himself. And so our big idea for this message is because Jesus cares for us, follow him. Because Jesus cares for us, follow him. Him. Back in Luke chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, the scripture said, Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things. As we have studied in the past few messages, and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. We've seen that prophecy fulfilled in these pages. And he must be killed, which is happening right now, and on the third day must be raised to life. Verse 23 says, though, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Christ foretold his death on the cross. And yet he said, if you want to be my disciple, you need to follow me. And part of following me is taking up your cross. And it's so interesting at the beginning of this passage. We are told about this man, Simon, from Cyrene in verse 26 who was conscripted to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. And scholars have puzzled over why this was included. There was really no reason on the surface to tell us that Jesus was unable to bear the weight of the crossbar himself. Many details about the resurrection are not given in the Bible because they're just not relevant. And so why was it found relevant not only to tell us that this man carried the cross beam of Jesus' cross, but to name him by name? And then when we, if we were to look at Mark's gospel, we would see that Mark not only names this man, but he says he is the father of two other people that he also names. And so what are we to take away from this? Well, it's a little bit of conjecture. But I think it's pretty clear that the fact that Mark named this man and his children indicates that Mark knew this guy even though he was from Cyrene, which is in Africa, okay? So this guy's from a long way away. And yet somehow Mark not only knew this name, but he knew the names of his children. What does that suggest? It suggests that Simon became a Christian. And in bearing the, bearing the cross beam of Christ, he in a sense literally acted out what Jesus said we should do spiritually. We should follow him carrying the cross daily. And so because Christ cares for us, and because he cared enough to die for us. The Bible says we should follow Him. And I just want to give you a couple of ways in which we can apply this in our lives, how we can understand the love of God and the care of Christ for us and follow Him accordingly. Because Jesus cares for us, follow Him. Because He cares for us, follow His prayer for forgiveness. And this is for you if you're not a Christian, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Following him begins when you receive the forgiveness that Jesus prayed about in this passage of Scripture. We read at the very end of our section in verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Asking for God the Father's forgiveness is how we enter into discipleship. It's how we begin becoming followers of Jesus Christ. 
And so if you're not a Christian, and you're starting to realize through this message what Christ has done for us, you realize that you are a sinner deserving the wrath of God for your sins. And you wonder how to receive the forgiveness of sins. The answer is to pray to God in a, very, a prayer very much like Jesus prayed. Jesus said, Father, give them the gift of forgiveness and repentance. And if you're not a Christian, this is how you receive the forgiveness of God. You ask for it. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and then verse 13 says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That means saved from the wrath of God. But verse 10 goes on and says this, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. And then verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How do you follow Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you? How do you experience the forgiveness of God that Jesus prayed for, for those who crucified him? The answer is, you call out to God in faith and ask to receive it as a gift. And so if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not a Christian, follow Jesus. Because you've seen his love poured out on the cross for you, follow him by praying for forgiveness and becoming a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus cares for us, we should follow him. And that means following his prayer for forgiveness, which is how everyone begins to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's how we begin to become followers of Christ. But for those of us who have trusted Christ, it's always helpful and important to be reminded of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. But it's also helpful to re remind ourselves that we are to follow Jesus in every way. And just as Simon perhaps demonstrates what it means to follow Jesus Christ by carrying the cross. So we too need to follow Jesus' commands. And one way to do that is to care for others. Because he cares for us, follow his command to care for others. I showed you part of the, this passage just a minute ago, and I want to come back to it from John chapter 15. Again, this is what Jesus said. Right before he was betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. God's command for us is to care about one another, other believers in Christ, just as Christ poured out himself because he cares for us. And he says in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And then in verse 16, he says this, you do not, did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Jesus told us not only to receive his forgiveness by faith, but once we begin following him by faith, we need to follow his example and love one another. And in the end of that passage, Jesus kind of gives us some specifics. He says in verse 16, You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. And this is in context referring to the fruit bearing of making new disciples. Part of the way we show our love and care for God and others and follow the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us is to give the gospel message to other people, just as Jesus did. As he was dying, he was still prophesying about the coming judgment of God and calling sinners to repentance. So you and I as his disciples, we can follow him and follow his care for us by caring for others, by giving the gospel. But he also says in verse 16, and so that whatsoever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And this looks like a general promise about prayer, but notice that it's followed up with these words. This is my command, love each other. What kind of prayer does Jesus have in mind? I think he has in mind prayer for other people. Part of the way we model and, and follow the care of Christ by caring for others is to pray for each other, to pray for God's work in one another's lives. Jesus cared enough for us that he thought 
nothing about himself, even as he was suffering on the cross of Christ. He was still reaching out in love to sinners. He calls us as his followers also to show love toward one another. Have you done that? Are you doing that? Are you showing love toward others by reaching out with the gospel of Christ? Are you praying for others, other believers to grow in their faith, to be strengthened in their walk with God, to follow Jesus in even greater obedience? Jesus cares for us, and the story of his death on the cross shows us again and again and again how much he cares for sinners. And because Jesus cares for us, we should follow him. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, let me urge you to receive the gift of grace and mercy from God, the gift of forgiveness of your sins. And for those of us who are Christians, let's think about how we can follow Jesus by showing love toward one another, showing the same kind of selflessness for one another that Christ himself showed for us. Because Jesus cares for us, follow him. At this time, we're going to have another worship song, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the message. And so if you want to take out the app and tap on the Sunday tab, tap on the back of the virtual response card, you have an opportunity there to respond to this message in a couple of ways. First of all, if you're not a Christian and this message has brought you to a place of repentance and you're ready to receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And we'd love to help you and talk with you about that. And so all you need to do is just put a check mark in the little box there that says, I would like to know more about how to become a Christian and give us some kind of contact information and we'll get in touch with you this week and show you what Christ has done for you to save you from your sins, from the wrath of God. If you have any other needs that we can help you with, anything that we can pray with you about, just go ahead and type it in on the app in the back of the virtual response card and then hit submit and let us know if it's just the, something the elders of the church and I should know about and pray for, if it's something we can share with others in our church who have agreed to pray for God's people. Let me pray as we close this service in another song of worship. Father, thank you for the love of Christ who gave himself for us. And I pray, Lord God, for anyone who needs to follow him in faith, Lord, that you would give them the gift of faith and repentance, that they would follow Jesus and receive his forgiveness for their sins. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are following Jesus, that you would help us to love others just as you have loved us. Give ourselves for the spread of the gospel and for the good of your people. And I ask this in Jesus' name and because of his love for us. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for this online sort of worship service. Some of our small groups have been meeting virtually, and if you would like to get in on that, uh, we would love to um, set you up with one of the groups and just let you know how to get involved with that. Um, you can go ahead and send us a message through the app, uh, through one of the virtual response cards, or you can just email us at info at calvary-bible.org, and uh, we'd love to get you plugged in with one of the small groups so you can fellowship, virtually speaking, with other believers in our church. I also want to let you know that we are planning to have a virtual Good Friday service uh, that will be released Good Friday, and also, of course, a virtual Easter Sunday service. And so uh, there'll be information coming out about those and how you can access them. But uh, you can look for that. We'll continue this series in both the Easter, uh, the Good Friday and Easter uh, Sunday virtual services. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the love of Christ who gave himself for us. And we ask, Lord, that you would use his gift, his love for us, to encourage us, Lord, in these strange times in which we live. Help us to look to you in faith and trust. And help us to care for one another in whatever ways that we can so you'll be glorified in us as your people. And Lord, we're asking that you would lift the scourge of this virus from us. That you would bring healing and give us an opportunity to resume our lives. I pray, Lord, for those who have financial needs because of this, that you would give great provision for them. And Lord, that you would open the opportunity for us to meet together to get together again as your people in the flesh so that we can worship you and glorify you as, as we should, as you've commanded us to do. Until then, Lord, we look to you for strength, for guidance, for provision for our needs, and we trust you to care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.